<laughs> they will find out some of the way that's true. We do know they did use communication a variety of ways, for instance, via music. So, if, yeah. if, for instance, if they're working in a, in a gang labor system, uh, they might communicate that a particular slave is going, that somebody's going to run away, so they need to cover for that person. So they might start singing work songs like this. And then using topography, like the, uh, the picture of the Cumberland Valley, and using these mountain ridges. So again, you know, the Mason-Dixon line, you can't really see it this way, but African-American escapees are using these mountain ridges. So Gettysburg is uh, right around here. That's located in some of the foothills of the South Mountain Range. This is all called South Mountain. And we know that African Americans use this range as well as many others and rivers and a host of other things to transgress the border. Right? So this border, the Mason-Dixon line, has legal power. It doesn't have any physical power. But it comes to symbolize something very important, that when you're on this side of the border, so this is the Maryland Crest, this is the Mason-Dixon line stone marker. When you're on this side, you're a slave. When you step on this side, you're free at least in African Americans' minds, and increasingly in the minds of white Northerners, some, not all, you should be free, but certainly not white Southerners. But they don't see that this, just because you step across this line, means that your legal status has changed. But increasingly, white Northerners, thinking back to my Arlington Cemetery picture, think, well, that slavery's okay in that space, but man, once they come into this space, it's at least questionable about what should happen in the minds of some, and this becomes a source of increasing contention through the antebellum period. So how many slaves actually escaped? Uh, John, uh, Hope Franklin, Lawrence Schweiger wrote a book called Runaway Slaves. They did copious amounts of research and come up with these numbers. And these are their, uh, some of their estimates. About five, now this is runaways, not escapees, runaways. About 5,000, 50,000 years, so a lot more than J.D. DeBoe and his census predicted or accounted for, but still in terms of proportions. So about 4 million slaves in either Civil War. So that's how many ignored this one in the middle. That's how many ran away. Consider proportions. That's how many stayed put. So the vast majority don't run. 50,000 a year is a lot, but it's a pretty small percentage. What about escapees, one who are running permanently? Well, from 1820 to 1860, that would be the proportion. And actually, this bar should be higher because there were more than 4 million slaves who lived from 1820 to 1860, so it would be even uh, more disproportionate. That's who attempt escape, not successfully escape. So there's a small percentage. The question is, what's their impact? Part of it, like uh, somebody said about competing economic paradigms, is competing legal systems. So initially, you have two legal systems in the United States, federal and state. The relationship between the two is kind of fairly loosely defined because we wanted, we wanted it that way. Americans wanted it that way. And escaping slaves begin to force that relationship to be more precisely defined because there doesn't seem to be a specific mechanism for how you're going to deal with the problem 
when they step from one side of that marker to the other. And for instance, one of the, there's this legal case um, that I will describe briefly. It's a legal case that goes to Pennsylvania Supreme Court of a runaway slave, and uh, Pennsylvania Supreme Court essentially, the, this guy Tillman, the head says at the end, through this Dr. Replevin, uh, that that if the Supreme Court upholds what the runaway slave and his uh, allies are trying to do, it's going to undermine the entire legal system and the relationship between the federal and state. Uh, this relationship that they're trying to define. But what you eventually get, because of run these escaping slaves, is three legal systems. You have the legal system of the northern states, the southern states, and the federal legal system. And they're all trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to deal with escaping slaves? And so in a country in which the law is king, as Thomas Paine said, how does that impact American identity? And I would argue that uh, these escaping black men and women force the issue, as Henry Box Brown says in 1851 after he escapes, he says there are laws in southern states that contrast with the civilized and free countries like the northern states and he says, in the South, there's a strong current of public opinion which law is altogether incompetent to control. And it is no longer a place, Henry Box Brown and other white and black northerners said, where the law is king. And white southerners are saying the same thing about the North. Because when these escaping slaves run away to the North, they're saying federal law is not being enforced. And the compact that held the country together is being undermined. And they're starting to perceive that the way that the law works in the North is very different from the way the law works in the South, and white Northerners is doing the same. And in many ways, uh, I would argue, therefore, you have these escaping people, black people, not simply slavery, who push the nation to war. And we, when I, we look briefly at the Article of Secession uh, from South Carolina, I think that will become even clearer. By the way, I would argue this is not news to Americans for quite some time. So one of the documents you have, uh, the Boston, from the Boston Daily Courier, Boston Courier, 1859. And as you can read in the first uh, paragraph, they're talking about the moderate members of Republicans. Um, and if you look at the second paragraph, it says, when the Republicans say they do not interfere with slavery in the states, it may be well to ask them who supports the Underground Railroad. So this writer is connecting and the Boston Courier publishing this, they're connecting these escaping slaves, and uh, they said maybe a little bit of conspiracy here. Well, they think the Republican Party is, is in an organized fashion making all this happen, which wasn't really true, although many of the white allies to escaping slaves probably were sympathized or were Republican. But they begin to, uh, some white northerners, as well as white southerners, are seeing this as a significant problem, and in 1863, this other one that you have, Enlistment of Negroes in the Army from Boston, July 13, 1863. This was published in, the, in a few different newspapers. Uh, this particular copy is from the Portland, Maine Daily Advertiser. This is starting from the top. And this is word diversity of opinion, and then it goes on. It says, some say, in um, that second sentence, it was caused by the improper interference of abolitionists. Their incendiary publications and speeches, their efforts, their contrast preserving efforts to deprive the slaveholder of his property by enticing his Negroes to run away, their organized underground railroad to facilitate their escape, and so forth. And there are hundreds of newspaper articles in both southern and, newspaper, and northern newspapers that talk about the problem of escaping slaves uh, and the failure of northern states and the federal government to, effect, to deal with it effectively. Uh, this guy, William Siebert, says the same thing uh, 30 plus years after the war. W. E. Du Bois, who some, hopefully all of you know, are familiar with, makes the same argument in 1909 that it was escaping slaves who were one of the main causes that pushed the nation to war, that divided the nation along the Mason-Dixon line because white southerners began to see this border as meaningless. It was The border was supposed to protect their property and it wasn't doing it. And the reason it wasn't doing it is because the federal government and northern states were not following the law and following the Constitution. This is a historian in 1945 uh, who made the same argument, and then historians kind of forgot about it. So in many ways, this project I'm working on, I say, I'm not actually saying anything new. I'm just reminding 
us of what people knew 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. So their impact on the South. This is one of you were mentioning about that, the example of the car, right? If somebody, if somebody's going to take all your cars. Uh, what it cost? Well, that's, slaves cost a lot of money. White Southerners. So when they run away, they're losing their investment. They're losing their future labor. <coughs> the cost of retrieving them. All this put together, uh, it it's, has a significant potential impact, especially for your slave owners who only own three or four or five slaves, which is most of them. Right? The Gone with the Wind image of people owning hundreds of slaves. That's a pretty pretty small number of slave owners. And one of them run away, they pursued it as probably more aggressive than anybody else because they've got money and time. Which is interesting because it affected them the least. But it's about this idea of what the country is supposed to be. So the Southerners argued that the North is scurrying the Constitution. This is the fugitive slave law. This is from the Constitution. This is what's in the Constitution. And then the Fugitive Slave Law of 1793 is supposed to give it some teeth. It doesn't really do that. And so thus Southerners pushed for the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Uh, this ad I like, this is from 1837. Um, so this woman, Betsy Merrick, with her three children, run away. It says Betsy is dark complexion, her children are mulattoes. So what, what does that suggest about why she might be running away? <laughs> Possibly, this is she's being has been raped by her owner, and not necessarily, but it's, we know that happened a lot, so there's a pretty good chance. Um, she, think about how difficult that would be. Most escapees are men, single men, but there is a significant number that are women. But running away with children, one of whom is an infant. So think about what drives a person to do that, to take that kind of risk. Some of them actually succeed. You might hear from uh, Deborah Calls about Kitty Payne later today, which is there's some success and failure in that. But part of what I, I find uh, fascinating about this, so this guy, Langdon, is not only wants her, but an extra sum of $30 of conviction of any white person or persons harboring them. So if there's any white folks helping them out, he wants uh, punishment. And that characterizes increasingly through the antebellum era the attitude of many white southern slaveholders and other people who don't own slaves but want to protect the institution. Personal liberty laws, you may be familiar with, like Pennsylvania has one, says that it is that state law enforcement officials cannot help slave catchers. So think about it, if you're a southern slaveholder, you potentially are losing a significant investment that can affect your future. Remember, this is 1830 and 40, there's no social security, right? There's no food stamps. I mean, if you go down, you're in big trouble. And I'm not saying we should feel sorry for those white southern slaveholders, but what they're doing is legal. It's not against the law. They're trying to build a better life for themselves and their family, just like many other Americans. And now all of that is at risk. So you can understand why they're pretty upset that a state like Pennsylvania said, you know what, we're going to tell our law enforcement officials they can't help enforce the law. Nullification. What's that? It's nullification in reverse. Yeah, that's what South Carolina and many others would say. Uh, so they passed the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 because white Southerners are still in control of uh, the federal government for the most part, which is uh, pretty harsh. You don't need any witnesses to establish whether somebody is a runaway slave. Um, but they continue to perceive Northerners as ignoring the federal government. Anthony Burns goes to Massachusetts uh, and writes a letter, I don't know why, back to his brother and his owner sees it, uh, finds out where he is, and you end up with uh, the president sending in the military to Boston Harbor, the Tea Party, to take a man from freedom back to slavery. And Bostonians break black curtains out the windows and protest as the army's marching through their Marines are marching through the street, and they're posting these kind of notices. And what people like Anthony Burns help do is a lot of those white anti-slavery people who weren't very sympathetic toward black people, like this one merchant, this is from Jamie McPherson's book. Uh, this is what he says, that basically he went to bed anti-slavery. 
And then Anthony Burns' affair happens where he sees the federal government come and take this black man back to slavery and he wakes up being an abolitionist. I don't think this happened with most white northerners, but it's starting to, uh, the division is starting to spread. But again, I would group this back. Well, what starts this? What starts it is a decision of one man, Anthony Burns, one woman, Betsy Merrick, to escape, right? that they are not going to do this anymore. And then as you get close to the Civil, or the Civil War, the election of Lincoln, uh, which we know is sort of the last straw for white Southerners, and black Northerners uh, actually are not that excited about Lincoln, many of them. Frederick Douglass is one of those who are, they basically, like this quote said, is they don't see much hope from either political party. And that triggers uh, South Carolina. And so we'll look quickly at this. So their declaration of secession, Can you read that all right in the back? Can you make it bigger? What does it mean in the back? Uh, so, and, and again, Georgia, Mississippi, Texas, South Carolina are the best examples of this. But South Carolina, which as we know, has led secession. Uh, white Southerners are not monolithic. Most of them are not that excited about secession in 1860. Most people don't want a war, and they sense it's a good chance it's going to happen. Uh, and so white South Carolina, and particularly the slave-holding elite, the slave power, they call them the slave power, which is what I always tell my students, is not the power of slaves, but the power of slave owners. But the slave power is northern economy. They're the ones who are pushing this and leading it. So South Carolina, they have this long preamble where they state the reasons why the, federal, why the United States exists. That they came together in 16, 1765, uh, and began this war, the Declaration of the Colonies, to be free and independent states. Any form of government becomes destructive, then people can abolish it. Uh, and this, there's an ongoing debate among constitutional scholars about whether secession was actually constitutional or not. Um, and they talk about the compact between the states, and part of that compact is that the, all the states have this compact to enforce constitutional federal law. And it's constitutional law that you will help retrieve fugitive slaves. So they have this, uh, this long preamble where they recount the history. And they say, we hold the government thus established is subject to the two great principles and the third fundamental principle, the law of compact. In the present case, this has uh, failed. We assert that 14 of the states have deliberately refused to fulfill their constitutional obligation. And so the first thing that South Carolina states, after this preamble, the first reason they say why we are seceding and what we're pointing to a failure is that these 14 states are not enforcing the Fugitive Slave Law. They're not enforcing the one in the Constitution, they're not enforcing the one in 1793, and they're not enforcing the 1851. So here you have the arguably the most powerful, along with Virginia, southern state, the leader of the secessionist movement, and their well thought out pre or their well thought out article of secession. The first thing they point to is these people are running away. And remember, this is a small percentage of slaves. It's not like tens of thousands of slaves are running away over here. It's a very small or escaping. There's a small percentage of slaves, and. Uh, there are some who would argue that economically, if the southern states had let all the escapees just escape, slavery would economically would have hung along just fine. Now, of course, it would have had a snowball effect and more would have gone away, so who knows. But the numbers who did escape had no economic impact on the South. Could but you this argue is this was like. I'm sorry. sorry. Could you argue this was like the threat of a bad example? Like to even though there weren't numbsure large numbers of runaways, yeah. like it was just the bad example that could set on other people if they were successful and got away. Yeah, I think that's part of it is that fear of it expanding. Uh, but I would I, I think a lot of it is about <coughs> in white southerners' minds uh, these escaping slaves point to what they perceive as a threat to their way of life. And by way of life, I'm not just talking about Southern utility, but that ec the, the economic and political and social foundation that slavery provided. And if the federal government isn't going to protect the fugitive slave law, what else aren't they 